What's up, everybody? Welcome to an emergency episode of the Dead Draw Gaming Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Echi, and joining me are some players that are pretty good at Pokemon. Uh, two of them just so happened to get top eight at Louisville Regionals this past weekend. So first up, we have Louisville finalist Michael Davidson. Michael, congrats on the seven grand. How are you feeling after, I, I guess, your best tournament performance yet? Yeah, I'm feeling great. Um, I knew that our deck had the capability to do it, and I, I was pretty confident someone in our group doing it. Uh, I am pretty happy it turned out to be me, though. All right. Next up, we have another Louisville top eighter, Gabe Smart, who piloted Terrapagos EX. Gabe, how are you doing? I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I started off 0-1 in the tournament, and I was like, this is going to be a really long event. Um, I was, you know, kind of expecting to have, I guess, I'm a relatively mediocre finish after the start. Um, I was not drawing very, very well throughout the first, you know, couple of rounds. However, um, you know, picked up a little steam, won 10 in a row. Um, and yeah, you know, making top eight is pretty cool at the second events of the season in the United States. So yeah, it was pretty good. Oh, wow. That is only our second event. Feels weird. Uh, I guess it is October, so I guess that makes sense. But, and of course, we're also joined by a man that is no stranger to top eights and one of the architects behind Michael's second place list, Andrew Hedrick. Andrew, how does it feel playing Lost Box again? Yeah, I was pretty excited to get to see a format where Lost Box was a little bit more viable, Ridge Drago. Not quite as popular as it used to be and lots of other good matches for the deck as well seeing as like the reduction of manaphy in a lot of decks is pretty big for that uh giving lost box an opportunity to shine my run wasn't able to go quite as well um lost my winning into the second good player on resi drago i hit and like so i missed day two but i was happy to see michael go far with the deck yep 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 so uh since this is an emergency episode we'll be focusing more so on the decks that are played by our guests here and their runs rather than just going through a bunch of meta decks. It was also just a week ago. So uh, obviously some things have changed since the tournament did happen. Uh, one of the big things to note, and the thing I wanted to bring up before we start, is that uh, Raging Bolt won. And on our previous episode, the title of which I wrote as Raging Bolt is overrated, uh, everyone but me was very down on the deck and called it overrated. And I saw some comments clamoring for a written apology from our guests that episode. So uh, Gabe, what do you have to say for yourself? Okay. So, I didn't say the deck was the worst thing in the world. I said that, you know, it was a deck that was able to play the game at a higher percentage. However, um, I do think that Raging Bolt lists with zero Bravery Charm um, is not an incredibly strong deck. After seeing, you know, kind of what happened, um, you know, at this tournament. However, I do think that a, um, in a Raging Bolt list that plays three to four of the charm, I believe Caleb Gettimer played three and then Xander Perot, who got top 16, ended up playing four. I think that that makes, you know, some of your matchups significantly better. And I think, you know, kind of changes the deck almost in a way. So, um, yeah, you know, we definitely were, you know, kind of wrong. However, um, the builds of Raging Bolt that saw success were relatively different than, um, you know, I guess the standard zero charm, you know, for Trek and Shoes. I think that Caleb's list didn't even play Trek and Shoes. It was more of, I think, like a conservative build. I think there was a Luminian in the deck. Um, there was a Slitherwing. There was two Ultra Ball as well. So the deck was built, I think, significantly um, more different. So, yeah. For sure. I will, uh, I'll make sure to get written apologies from Benny and Jake for the other guests on the episode uh, as well. But, yeah, obviously, uh, the Raging Bolts that did well are kind of built different from what we've seen do well in previous tournaments. Uh, but, obviously, it was still a very strong call for the event and did very well. So... Uh, there's that. Now, uh, I guess the next place to start then is just going over everyone's runs at Louisville. Um, I can I can start because I'll be pretty quick. I played Lugia. The list was pretty similar to a rules list, uh, notably including the Wellspring Mask Ogre Pond because it's really strong when nobody's playing Manaphy, which we'll talk about more with Lost Box stuff later. Uh, I started 4-2 with my two losses being some really, really close sets to two really good players being uh, Kamal and Ross Cawthon. And then from there, I uh, I just stopped summoning Archeops and I just bombed out of the last two rounds. <laughs> so not super eventful, but uh, I didn't prep that much. Uh, not as much as I needed to, at least. So I'm not super surprised. Um, Andrew, did you want to talk any more in depth about your run? Um, I guess we'll go over it a little bit. Um, I started out 3-0, so I assume I'm pretty good. Beat up on some Dragon Ball Dustnor, which is a really good matchup. They don't ever play Mana Free. And you kind of just get a Greninja stuff. Um, also beat him right on. Not a matchup I really expected to hit, but really good. They can't really deal with Ursa Luna, especially if you limit your bench to where they can't kill it with Raikou um, with under ear zero. So I was able to get a 3-0. Lost a close one to a Lugia. Um, I got 
kind of surprised by a Thornton. I had Spirit Tomb in place, so he couldn't win many on. His Ursulina was discarded, so I kind of thought I was safe. He had no Mancinos in play or anything. And then he goes Thornton into Ursulina to knock out my Iron Hands. And then it was like, I brick game three. So that was kind of rough. Uh, beat a Palkia Dustin right after that. That's also a pretty good matchup. But then I ended up losing to a Reggie Drago. Uh, Lucas Zing took him to three games. Wasn't able to quite get it done there. Beat a Lugia round seven, but then I hit another Reggie Drago and Christian Lavella. And also went to three games, uh, but was not able to get it done. Pretty bad matchup. That's tough, yeah. So I missed it. Team, yeah. team kill at the end. Brutal. Um, so I guess going from there, then Gabe, obviously with the top eight finish, had a much longer run than both me and Andrew. Do you want to just deep dive into how your run went? Yeah, so I started off in the first round. I played up against Alugia. Um, I bricked game one, and I was like, okay, this is going to be a long tournament. And then, then um, I think in game two, I set up pretty well, and I won pretty convincingly. And then in game three, I also bricked. And um, the list that I played, um, I think I originally had four Trapagos for Ultra Ball. However, I cut down to um, three, three of each and went up to, I believe, the fourth Buddy Puffin. And then I added in the Manaphy as well. So I admittedly cut a little bit of consistency for like that first and second turn of the game, and I got instantly punished. So um, I was pretty concerned. Um, Rowan Stavenow played the exact same 60 as I did. Um, and I shot him a message and I was like, I think we made a mistake on the list. And then everything, you know, kind of started to, um, you know, work out pretty well. I, I had a couple of pretty interesting matchups. Um, I played against a Ferrigarath in round three. Um, definitely was a deck that I really wasn't expecting. Um, I hit multiple Raging Bolts, um, you know, towards the beginning of the tournament as well, which, you know, kind of, um, like helped me get you know some of those relatively easy wins because the majority of those lists weren't even playing um, heavy charm, so those you know felt like relatively easy. I ended up um, heading into day two at seven one. Um, heading into day two, I played against a Trapagos Mirror, was able to two o that. I then played against a Lugia, um, was able to I think I two o that as well. Um, and then I played against Caleb Gedimer. Um, in the winning end, technically, uh, he was, I believe, 10 and 0 at the time. I was 9 and 1. Uh, we played a really, really close set. Um, Caleb's list had um, three Bravery Charm, also three Switch Card as well. So it was a little bit of a different list. Um, he also had, I believe, the Slither Wing as well. Um, the one that first attack, I think, like mills a card, and then the other one, um, like one shots a Terrapagos. So that was, you know, definitely kind of scary. But I set up relatively perfectly in that set. I had a turn where I missed. Um, something but i owned it and like to perfect like three or four cards so that you know kind of saved me and i was able to 2-0 them and then i took the tie versus reggie drago headed into top cut as i believe third seed and i played against palkia um that set was very very close um i lost game one won game two and then in game three i unfortunately prized both of my fan rotom however um i was kind of able to restabilize and got relatively close to winning the game um just was one card short so yeah i mean you know, seventh place is still you know, pretty good, especially after starting off with a pretty rough, you know, first round. So yeah, can't really complain. How did how did you beat Ferrigarath? What what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> okay. For full transparency, I wasn't a hundred percent sure what the card did. All I remember was it was pretty good against Raging Bolt. Um, and then I realized, oh, you know, basics, you know, can't do any damage. However, there's a very unfortunate part about that card is that it has two hundred and sixty HP. So if you use um two of um of the dusk Norse, you just knock it out so that was you know pretty easy i also you know started to hit with um something like the pidgeot as well um because that's a stage one um and their deck wasn't necessarily super consistent so there were times where they would just have to get the frigger out that but they actually couldn't really attack with it so you know like i had a couple turns you know to kind of like work around that so yeah definitely was not something that i expected to play against uh was probably one of my most enjoyable sets though um so yeah that was quite fun for sure very interesting very interesting yeah it's uh it's it's funny when you hit the rogue stuff that also in theory should counter your deck pretty hard but yeah dustin yeah. was pretty good against that so sounds good um i want to dive into terapago stuff and your list decisions later so i but before we do that i wanted to have michael also go over your run obviously getting all the way to the finals and then having some unfortunate things happen in the finals but uh wherever you want to start go ahead uh my first round of day one was against iron thorns we did too. Uh, which i think is what sorry yeah my first round of day two was against yeah. iron thorns i think that's one of our deck's easiest matchups to be honest you can just use your one prize attackers to even out the prize trade and 
Uh, I think both games I set up a arm press that kind of just like checkmated them and they weren't able to deal with. Um, after that, I versed my f- second Raging Bolt of the tournament. Uh, I ended up winning 2-0. I believe both games against that opponent, I amped for three prizes and then found my other three prizes uh, in a combination of Kramer and Ursaluna. And then I had a very similar next two games against another Raging Bolt. The second Raging Bolt in day two had Slitherwing, which is pretty annoying, but um, I was able to amp for three prizes one of the games and just use the Ursaluna strategy the other one. So pretty simple win there and then in my last round i versed a pidgeot control which was my only control deck of the tournament and uh playing spear tomb he was never able to even though he was able to set up pidgeot both games he wasn't able to ever overwhelm his hand with like a multitude of options so after both games i was able to draw um boss kill pidgeot with arm press uh, it was just very difficult for him to win, and I ended up 2 owing. In top eight, I hit Kieran Farah on his same exact Baltimore 60 that he got second with, so very good Lugia player. He was not able to get a great setup game one uh, with Spirit Team in play. He, I, I lost the flip, but he didn't have a super aggressive turn one, and... He was only able to summoning star for one Archeops and a Chinchino. And he wasn't able to deal with my early Iron Hands. And then eventually the board state got to where he, off my Rock Sand, he would need to draw Jet Energy, a Pokemon, and Raw Boss's orders with Spirit Tomb in play. So it was almost impossible for him to win because I, I crammed his Ursaluna, which was its only Pokemon in play. Um, I had my Ursuna, which was damaged on the bench, so if he hit the three cards, he would have game. But I knew it was almost impossible for him to draw those exact three cards off Roxanne. And then game two, he went first. I had a really slow start, and he was just able to overwhelm me with turn two Ampy very much, and I basically had no response. And then game three, I went first. I got Spirit Tomb down early. He was only able to get one Lugia down, and I was drawing very well and was able to Ampy very much his only Lugia turn one with Prime Catcher. So, and then the turn after that, I won with Boss's Order Squawk ability and Ampy very much for my last three prizes. So, very quick game there and pretty unfortunate draws from him. And then in top four, I lost the flip to Zard, which is a little scary because if they go first and they get a strong turn, they can a lot of time get a Rotom off because you won't have Spirit Tomb in play. So, definitely a little bit scary to lose. The flip, even though he didn't play Manaphy, um, but I was able to, because he didn't play Manaphy, I was able to turn one uh, Moonlight Shuriken and kill both of his Charmanders. And even though he said a Pidgeot, he was just so far behind, and I was able to pretty easily win the prize trade in that one. Uh, after that, he won game two uh, because, I mean, he went first, he got a very strong setup. I was not really putting on any pressure. And as soon as they take the first prize card, it becomes very difficult to win because they can set up their Dustmore plays, their Briar plays, and uh, just very difficult to win that one. Game three, I get the turn two Greninja playoff, kills both of his Charmanders. Uh, He does get Pidgeot into play, but he actually... Did not get Pidgeot into play immediately. He has to instant charge for a turn and then Thornton into Pidgeot later. And by that point, I'm already so far ahead that because of how much time was gone, um, as long as I... And he was also playing a little bit slow, to be honest. He definitely could have been making some quicker actions. And by the time time was called, um, he was turn zero and I had one prize left while he still had four. So it was never possible for him to win the prize trade. I could have won on my last turn of time just with a Sableye play, but I ended up just passing because based on the time rules, he could never win the game. And then in finals, I versed Caleb Gedimer, which was my fourth bolt of the tournament. Um, I was 3-0 against bolts, but I knew his list. Despite no man, if he had a lot of annoying cards, like the three Bravery Charm, the three Switch Cart, made a lot of 
one prize lines and more difficult. Game one went pretty much perfectly. Game two, I think, was really unfortunate. Um, <laughs> I used like three Poke Stops, only getting one out to basic Pokemon, and then I didn't draw any other outs off that comfy, which I think I had a decent amount as well. And then I think by the time I used the Poke Gear, I think I had over 50% chance, uh, if me and Andrew's math is correct, that I think I had over 50% chance to draw one of my four chorus there and just did not draw one, which was very unfortunate because I do think that game was winnable with how many resources he was down, even though he was pretty ahead on the prize trade. And then game three, we both have a very mediocre start. My star definitely picks up a little bit after I drew a, p a puff in to get two more comfies. And... I'm a little bit like confused on what to do and I end up making a really, really bad play. Probably I think the worst play I made all tournament going for a Greninja, which is so punished by him just having the switch card attack, which I thought his hand was like extraordinarily weak, which it, it maybe was before the Pheasant Dippity, even though he took a Nesp off his prizes. But as soon as he basically as soon as he switch cart attacks there, the game is almost lost on the spot with how much with the resources I had prized and the resources I was down it's almost impossible for me to win as soon as I make that ninja play. So that, I think, was my worst play of the tournament by far. But overall, still super happy with my run, my first regional top eight, and I'm able, I was able to get second. So super happy with how the tournament went. Just wish I played game three of finals a little bit better. Gotcha. Makes a lot of sense. I know uh, the, the, the big thing I noticed from your, your matchups was obviously not hitting a single ready drago the entire tournament which is yeah. not something i don't can any of the other team members even say that <laughs> that we're playing lost box uh um, no one on our team yeah. Okay. yeah no one on our team can say that but ginsburg who played a one card off of our list gotcha. did also did not hit any Reggie Drago. Yeah, yeah obviously very helpful considering that matchup is effectively an auto loss right yeah actually no i saw I mean, somebody didn't I somebody would... get one win on the team against Reggie Drago. <laughs> It was like one in thirteen, right, or one in twelve was the all. Justin record. got one win in seniors when his opponent prized cure him back to back <laughs> games, but <laughs> that's that so the... sad. I would feel so bad if that was them. But uh, great for Justin. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I wanted to go into both Trapagos and Lost Box in particular for this episode and just talk about your individual lists and kind of deck building decisions for them. And then I want to do a little bonus episode after for the Patreon where we just talk about general deck building for a regional. So um, I guess we'll start with some Lost Box stuff because I wanted to ask, there, there was like th kind of three main things I wanted to talk about with Lost Box in terms of like deck building decisions. Um, and we have two people here who worked on it. So the, the first one, I guess, is uh th this is something that hunter butler we were talking about it during the regional i think this was during day one he was saying he talked to you guys about the list and he, uh and he mentioned that y'all were playing the, the the energy count was three water three psychic and then two lightning and he was like why would you not just play four water if you wanted the extra energy uh because obviously it gets you more greninja more often but uh, what was your reasoning for for not doing the fourth water and doing the third psychic instead even though you only had the one save line? So we, w I wanted to play four water energy in the deck, but it like makes your mirage gate super awkward a lot of the time when you have too much of one type of energy. Like sometimes that like I like I've tried it. Be I tried it before NAIC. I didn't like it. I was like, okay, maybe it's fine. I tried it again before this tournament. It also didn't work. You'd end up with like you need to double mirage gate, and your deck is like three water energy, one psychic energy, or you need to mirage gate once, and your deck's just like two water energy, and it just gets really annoying to where. It just completely messes up with like your ability to use mirage gates, especially if you like lost in some energies early too that aren't the water energies. Then it gets like really annoying to use mirage gates. Did you feel pretty confident that the extra psychic was better than the extra lightning? Um, I think so. I mean, neither are like that great. Um, but like three psychic lets you just naturally draw into like the means to use save by more often, so you don't have to use a mirage gate. Whereas, like, there really isn't that much use for three lightning. It lets you use arm press, but you don't use that attack that often anyway. It's, like, okay, but neither are, like, that great. I will say if you wanted to play the Zapdos that Tyler Matthews played, then you would play the three lightning. And I think that card's actually pretty decent. I didn't even know yeah. that card existed. So. <laughs> it's 
it's like decent and then you could like there's no real reason you need three psychics so you could easily cut that for the lightning if you were gonna play that yeah that zapdos seems really strong in general especially when there's so much bulky running around too uh it's a really strong single prizer that hits for, for those who didn't seen it who haven't seen it it's does 190 damage as a basic lightning uh pokemon uh, you just have to discard all the energy which is totally fine because it's gonna die anyway most likely so uh yeah tyler played that to top 32 top 16 32 okay and did pretty well with it so definitely a consideration for a lost box going forward uh the, the other thing i wanted to talk about was kind of manaphy slash the lack thereof because obviously gabe was one of the few Terrapagos that did actually play manaphy and it worked out pretty well for you actually i was gonna ask how how often did it come up in your matches um, in day one, I played against one Reggie Drago and one Palkia. Um, Palkia is not necessarily amazing against simply because they can use um you know, something like a Duskinor and then they can use Radiant Greninja. However, it does require them to get another piece, which you know sometimes they're not able to do. Um, I think it came up versus the Reggie Drago I played against. Um, I think there was like a turn or two where they had a chance to cure him, but since um like the Manifu was on the field. They weren't actually able to do that. And and like those are pretty much the only matchups where um it actually was kind of useful. I played up um I played versus a Bon who ended up playing, I believe, the same Guard of War 60 as Henry Chow mm -hmm. um in round eight, and they were playing um Screamtail. So that was like one matchup as well where I believe it came up in the first game, um, where I discarded it um because they bought my stadium and then they used Screamtail. Then I think I used like stretcher to get it back down, possibly. So I think like in that matchup, it can also, you know, sometimes be like relatively okay. Um, but the main reason for the man if he was we felt that the Reggie Drago matchup, if you went first and you had access to something like Manaphy, was going to be slightly favored. And I think that if you're going first reg like versus Reggie Drago and you don't have Manaphy, I still think you're slightly unfavored. So I expected Reggie Drago to show up. I still think it's a relatively solid deck. There were, I believe, plenty um, that made it to the second day. One got, uh, I believe, uh, fifth place. So the deck definitely did okay. So that was kind of the main reason as to why I wanted to play the Manaphy. And also, it's kind of a consistency card in a way, just because you're trying to full board as quickly as possible. So, you know, that's another card that, um, you know, you can drop on the bench. So it, it kind of helps, like, with the consistency of you know, being able to hit 220 on the second turn of the yeah. game. So it has multiple uses for sure. I personally liked it. I think it's probably the flex card in the list. Um, it definitely is the card that, you know, you could possibly cut if you wanted it. Sure. On that note of Manaphy, then, for Lost Box, uh, obviously, this past weekend, not a lot of decks played it, and that helped a lot for multiple matchups, I'm sure, just being able to Greninja pretty consistently. Uh, and you're, I believe the list also did not play it, right? Yeah, there's no Manaphy in your list. You hit a mirror, though, that did play it. So if, if Manaphy does uptick after this weekend, which I don't necessarily think it will, do you think that it kind of weakens Lost Box to like a significant amount do you think it's the type of thing that you would consider playing lost box at all going forward uh i guess just general thoughts on manaphy in, in and against lost box manaphy is really annoying especially in like the stage two decks it's definitely not as big of a deal in terrapagos because sableye is just so strong in that matchup sure. but i mean i think almost always versus almost any deck you would rather play against no manaphy than manaphy but i think especially in the stage two decks like Charizard and Dragapult, Manaphy can be really annoying and remove a lot of win cons. The reason we didn't play it ourselves, for the most part, the most relevant matchup is Reggie Drago for at least the Manaphy. And either way, the matchup is still like horrible. So we didn't think Manaphy would be that good versus Palkia, which is another like deck where it could be relevant. A lot of times they can just dust more the Manaphy anyways. Right, right. So it's not as re relevant in that regard. Yeah, I would say, like, we tested the matchup against Reggie Drago when we had Manaphy. And assuming they still had Canceling Cologne, it, like, usually did not really make a huge difference in the matchup. Now, if they don't play Cologne, it actually would help a decent amount. But I expected most of them to play Cologne. And looking at the statistics on Limitless, it was, like, 0.7. So that's it's not it's very bad to still if they have Cologne. They can just, at some point in the game, bring it up, take three. Right, right. Usually winning three attacks doing that, like so. As long as they, as long as they have an ability to win in three attacks, which is the cologne they still do, it's pretty bad. So right. We decided it was not worth it. 
Yeah, makes sense. And then uh, I guess just general kind of Pokemon and supporters. I guess just the list as a whole, like, is there any cards that you felt were kind of underutilized and just not as effective this weekend? Obviously, it seems like the, the list is very kind of general anyway and can kind of handle anything that you throw at it. Is there anything that you felt you would change, kind of looking back on how the meta actually shaped up? Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I can't think of anything that I would have rather played in the list. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Andrew maybe could, but I felt that the list was almost perfect for the event we just kind of had to not dodge or just not hit the dragos and maybe the tyler matthews's zapdos is a little bit interesting but i'm not sure how our list would have been changed to include it sure. but andrew probably has some different thoughts yeah i agree i think our list was really good and happy with where it ended up i like the zapdos idea i would have considered that if i knew about it but um i don't even know what you would cut for it um, and I think the one other card you could consider is Fezendipity. That was a card we kind of talked about. We didn't really end up trying that much, but um, Friday, Caleb tried it for a few games. Uh, said he didn't like it too much, so we just decided not to add it into the deck. But Ginsburg, the one card he changed was he put in Fezendipity over the Poke Gear. He said it was pretty good for him, so that could be another card worth trying out. So I would say the two considerations would be Fezendipity and Zapdos. But I don't really know what we would cut. I really like all the cards that are in the deck. Right sure. Now, so. <laughs> I think Poke Gear might be the most cuttable slot, but I don't know. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't work for Michael in the finals anyway, so you might as well just cut it. Yeah, it was <laughs> not great throughout the event. I think it did hit a few times, but for the most part, the card was a little bit mid. Ended up in the loss zone quite a lot <laughs> and failed me when I needed it most. So. Yeah. Definitely could be a consideration to cut. Definitely the easiest flex spot in the deck. But if you're going to cut gear, I would recommend adding some like other consistency like Fezendipity. Sure. But like the issue that comes up sometimes with Poke, if you don't have Poke gear though, is like finding your one of supporters in the late game or eventually off of a pal pad can be pretty difficult as well. And that's something I've noticed in games I've played without Poke gear. It can like, if you're digging for a boss or Roxanne at the end, it's just a lot harder to actually find it. So one, one thing to mention too is, uh, Hunter is very pro Tatsugiri and has been playing it in all of his Lost Box lists. And your group seems to be very anti Tatsugiri, not playing it at NAIC or for this event, uh, it's still doing very well. Uh, why do you hate Tatsugiri? What's wrong with it? I've never tried it. I feel like you'd rather <laughs> use a comfy, though, if you're going to like get a Pokemon on your board and switch into it. I mean, I mean, it has to be decent if he likes it so much, but I've never considered it. I didn't even like, really think about that option. Yeah, I wouldn't say that we're like anti Tatsugiri. It's just not like something we ever really like tested or considered in the deck because it just seems like a little bit anti synergistic. Like if you whiff Chorus, which you probably whiff a decent amount, it's just like a gear, then that could have just been used on another comfy slot. So I don't know. Not that I think the card is bad particularly, but I just, it's not really something we considered in our list. And then I guess just any any other thoughts on Lost Box going into future regionals? Uh, obviously, Lille regionals coming up this weekend. Meta will obviously maybe slightly adjust going from Louisville, but probably not substantially given how close the events are. Um, do you do you expect like would, if you're going to Lille, would you would you change anything in this list? Would you just run it back immediately? I think I would just play the same list for the most part. Um, I think honestly. I think there will be a rise in Bolt. I would recommend learning some of the one prize game plans that finish with Ampy very much for three, because that's what I was a little bit inexperienced going into the finals with. And in games where not everything goes perfect, you really do have to consider some of those lines. And they're not super obvious, so you, you have to do some of your own math. But I do think Bolt will increase, and I don't think Reggie Drago will change substantially maybe it even goes down but um the biggest thing i see is a bull increase because people will feel validated by picking it since it just won a big u.s regional what about you andrew would you just run the same list as well make any changes yeah i mean i would probably try the two cards i suggested but if you told me i just submit a list right now i just submit the same 60 that that we already had so i think the deck is pretty good all your matches are pretty good besides Reggie Drago, I would say like every other like relevant matchup is like 50-50 or better. So sure. I like the deck a lot. All right. Uh, I guess kind of on the note, Gabe, uh, 
what, what is how does the lost box matchup work for for Terrapagos? Um, I personally think it's slightly better than what they probably think it is. <laughs> um, I feel like it. <laughs> um, so I tested the matchup a little bit a couple weeks ago, and I was trying to use my Dustnor as quickly as possible. And you know, like at that point, then like a Blood Moon just kind of sweeps your board. Um, the night before, um, when I was playing the matchup, I was evolving the um into the Dustinor and just like sitting it there. Like I wasn't, you know, like using it unless I absolutely had to use it. And like at that point, it felt like the matchup got a little bit closer. I think with Manaphy as well, it definitely gets significantly closer. I don't think the matchup is great personally. I think it's probably 40-60. Um, but I do think with like with the Manaphy, if you can go first and you can get the rare candy um, for the Dustinor on the second turn of the game and just kind of sit it there. Because the problem is, is that if they hit you with Ursa Luna, you have no real way to deal with it. So... When you're sitting with the Duskinar on the board, that's kind of your way to deal with it. So I felt like the matchup was winnable for sure. I know Rowan um, who ended up playing the same 60 as I did, played against Caleb Rogerson, um, playing Lost Box, and I believe Caleb 2 0 Rowan. Um, so yeah, I definitely think the matchup is unfavored for sure, but I do think you have a chance. I do think if you do play the Buffalons, you're probably significantly closer. I do think if you play something like the Jirachi as well, um, your matchup probably becomes slightly closer too, but at that point, you're just putting in a bunch of bad cards, right? <laughs> what is that oh. reaction? <laughs> Jirachi, I mean... <laughs> if you want to stop that Sableye, also... it's not terrible. I, I think the Manaphy is significantly scarier than the Buffalo as well because it's just like Yo, it's so hard for them to get out the two Buffalo's. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they, they can't commit the well, they, yeah. searches. They can That's why Jirachi is like, bad. Okay. You can't get them both out as well. Yeah. You came with well, both I mean, a little bit you, easier. But... You wouldn't. <sighs> Jirachi's horrible. Jirachi's not good. I'm not saying to play Jirachi. I'm just saying if you're trying to help the matchup. The, the other cards at least have purposes in other matchups, bro. <laughs> yeah. like, this is just Lost Box propaganda. They don't want you to play Jirachi and Jirachi. We're not taking for 4% Lost Box. <laughs> I would not tech for Lost Box. I don't. Yeah. Um, I think that Reggie Drago, if it continues to see success, will eventually potentially just like push it out of the format. I think that if like Lost Box um, see success at the um, upcoming two or three events, I do think that players will be more incentivized to play Reggie Drago, um, and I think that that will probably hurt the deck to begin with. So yeah, definitely could see uh, some Reggie Drago continue to uptick this weekend. But again, it's probably too close to really be like impacted heavily by Louisville. Um, I think most people aren't going to change their lists. Yeah. And I think that's really important because, like, the majority of players who are going to this event have, you know, had their deck, you know, locked for probably like the past week. And I think that not a whole lot of people, you know, kind of, I guess, like, think that way. But I think they should, you know. I think that, you know, like, these results might change, like, a portion of them. But I think at least, like, half the event, you know, these tournament results from the past week didn't really change. Gotcha. Their opinion. I do think. I do think maybe Lost Box makes it to the second graphic, like how they do the the seventh through twelfth most played decks. I would be pretty, I mean, maybe not confident, but I would not be surprised at all if Lost Box ended up on that one. How much but was it this weekend? I would not. Basically, I think it was nothing. on it. Right? I never thought the deck was dead, but right, I didn't see. That I would part, not be the second surprised. graphic. I don't think it was on it, I, but all I'll say is I, I would not be surprised if it at least makes it onto the second graphic in lieu. Yep. I know there's it would have been on the second block. graphic in day two, yeah. but yeah, I don't think it's day one. I think in day two, it was definitely top 12 most played day. For sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah people love flower selecting. People are going to be like, oh, I can play it again? Let's go. After being uh, repressed from playing it for like three months, I'm sure they'll be happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so talking about the Terrapagos list, tell me about Vitality Ban, Gabe. Why, uh, why was yes. it worth the slot? Yeah, so the card is really good in the mirror match, um, you know, because being the first one to hit for, you know, 230 is really important. Also is good versus, um, you know, anything that plays, you know, something like the Iron Hands, for example. Lugia, a lot of the time will try and, like, hit you with, you know, something like the Hands on the second turn of the game. Um, that's something that, you know, sometimes pops up. Uh, sometimes it randomly comes up where, like, you're 10 damage short, like, versus, you know, something... I think there was a couple times where I was like, oh, I'm 10 damage short. Oh, you know, here's a Vitality Band. Great. Uh, so it came up in a couple, like, really random situations. But the main two reasons are, you know, things you know, like the Traffic Ghost Mirror Match and then also Hands as well. I'm trying to think if there's any other important 230 HP Pokemon in the format. But those would be kind of the main two that I can yeah. think of as of right now. I had a really stupid random situation when I was practicing earlier today where I, I just fan wrote him Assault Landing Alugia for 50. And then I was able to Vitality Band clean it up with the Serapagos when it evolved next turn. It was pretty great. 
Uh, but yeah, like Vitality Band, you're actually also not the only person who played Vitality Band in top eight because the Lugia list was also, or one of the Lugia list, um, not Kieran's, uh, I forgot their name. It was Yurko. It actually list, came up with yeah. a win in the top eight because he was able to punch with, I think, a DTE. Yeah. Um, yeah. And knock out the Teal Mask Ogre Pond, which was really, really cool. I think that makes that matchup, you know, even stronger um because like you can yeah i think that was like you know pretty cool but i actually don't know the exact reason because i don't think that was like the main reason that he chose to play it i don't know if there's some like math that it fixes um uh, I that oh true yes 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 <laughs> that that's that's probably very important because yeah. you probably don't want to smack into it with something like a shinchino um like unless you absolutely have to I and, feel and like you don't want to have like, to rely on bear all the time either for every single terapagos knockout so I feel like if you get that off you probably just beat them i don't know how they really kind of deal with that sure because they have to kind of commit to you know, like dealing with the terapagos which means then they're not like focusing on other things so i bet that probably makes the matchup if they you know actually can find it pretty good the problem is is you're playing lugia and so much of the time you have to be like using a draw supporter on like that second turn of the game which is probably yeah. the turn where it'd be like most useful so that's like the one thing where i was like i don't know but he used it in the stream game it seemed like pretty good in the stream game um i think it allowed him to get like double archaeops into the discard pile or something like pretty explosive um so that was kind of cool to see but yeah how, how did you feel about your list in general uh we already talked about man if you talked about vitality band uh you said you were kind of worried about the Trapagos count, but it worked out totally fine in the end. Uh, just, just yeah, how do you feel about like how all the cards ended up working out for you? Yeah, so the Trapagos count was the first thing that I was a little bit concerned about. But like to be honest, you don't really want to bench the Trapagos on the first turn, you know, kind of to begin with. So three felt totally fine, um, you know, except for the first game. That was the only one where I was like, dang, like I kind of wish I had a little bit more. But like throughout the rest of the tournament, it felt fine. This was honestly one of the probably the most complete lists that I feel like I've ever played. Um, there really wasn't a card that I felt like didn't necessarily have a whole like a lot of. Um, I guess like use so for example a couple weeks ago um i went to dortmund and at that event um, i was playing charizard and i had a couple cards where i was just like i'm just you know, like, not really using these at all i think i used palpad maybe two or three times um so i've definitely played some lists over the past a couple events where i felt like i had some cards that you know could have been something else right mm -hmm. and like this was definitely the event where i felt like everything kind of had its purpose but i know i said this a little bit um you know towards the beginning of the podcast but i do think that manaphy is a card that you could potentially cut i'm not 100 percent sure exactly what you would want to cut it for you could maybe play you know like a third iono possibly um maybe second pidgey that was actually something that i ran into a couple times actually in my top eight i believe in game three i prized pidgey or pidgeot um, which kind of created a situation where if I had gotten that out, um, you know, maybe a turn earlier, uh, I was one card short um, from winning the game. The only turn I got it out was the turn before that I lost. Um, it was like the final turn of the game, effectively. And um, if I had gotten that out in like a turn or two, you know, maybe before, I think I would have had enough cards to win. So that's like one thing um, that I wasn't really 100% sold on was the 1-1 one, one Pidgeot, and it didn't really hurt me throughout most of the tournament, but there were situations where games got a little bit more difficult than they necessarily should have, um, you know, since I prized, um, you know, like one of the three pieces, like the Featherball or the 1-1 one, one Pidgeot sure. line. So if you could find room for 2-2, two, two, I definitely think it's really good, but um, yeah, yeah, I felt like the list was... I, I know uh, a lot of the debates when I was talking to players who were considering Traffickles was like, do you do the the thinner Hoot Hoot Noctowl line to have the thicker Pidgeot line? Uh, and I think, yeah, obviously you do the 4-4 four, four, Hoot Hoot Noctowl. Uh, do you feel pretty confident that that's just the correct way to play it with those and you can't cut those? Yeah, so the problem that you run into is when you go down to 3-3, three, three, um, you, like, you hit the situation where you oftentimes fan wrote them for two Noctowl, and they hit you with a hand disruption card. Mm. And all those go to the bottom. So if you prize the third one, there's oftentimes going to be a chance where you simply just you know completely break off that Iona, right? So that's kind of the issue that I ran into when I was playing three. I think that it's just the strongest card in the deck. Like that's like the reason the deck um like is able to function. So I don't think I would mess with the knock towel line. I would probably um mess with some of like the tech cards. Like for yeah. example, um you know, something like the Manaphy, right? Maybe Vitality Ban, even though I felt like Vitality Ban was pretty good. So yeah. Did you... I would like a second Pidgey if I could. Yeah, it. for sure. Did you ever? Uh, I, I noticed you played the the Silent Wing Hoot Hoot. Did you ever Silent Wing during the tournament? No, no. So <laughs> the, yeah. So the so the argument for both of them is that technically that one is I think can come up a few more times than normal. Um, the the one other situation um, is that if you play the one that does ten times ten, mm -hmm. um, the logic is is that you could like 
if you play it, you could bait your opponent into thinking that you play like a jet energy or something like that. But that's just going like, you know, pretty deep down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, like things that probably like will never matter. There was one other reason as well um, that it sometimes pops up. Uh, I forget the exact reason as to why, but there was something else as well where um, that like 10 damage. Oh, yes. Um, the other one was you can knock out a Cleffa. Um, when they have like a Temple of Sinnoh in play. That's like a very niche um, thing that will probably like never come up, but you know, sometimes it could. Sure, but, sure. Yeah, I, I think they're pretty relevant. They're pretty much almost as relevant as, you know, some like the Dust Coals as well. I don't think like those like really matter either. So I wouldn't like stress too much if you don't have access you know, like, to those artworks and cards. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I was curious about that because uh, it's, it's, it seems like you can do either or with the double turbo anyway. You kind of flex it, but yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you how do you feel about Terrapagos kind of going forward and going to next couple regionals here? Obviously, I, I don't know if it still was like the best converting deck for this tournament as well, like it has been for previous ones, but uh, obviously did very well. So, so I think that it is still a tier one deck. I think that a lot of people were saying it was the clear cut strongest deck heading into this tournament. However, I think heading into um, Lil and also Poland. I, I don't think that's the case. I do think that Raging Bolt, if they do play for Bravery Charm, is definitely a pretty sketchy matchup. Outside's probably 50-50, maybe even slightly unfavored. The Bravery Charm has just like changed the matchup so much, you yeah. know, almost to the point where you might have to play, you know, something like Lost Vacuum now, and then like you're, you know, possibly like having to cut something like Manaphy. So then your list like becomes, you know, kind of weaker versus like some other matchups. I think that your Palkia matchup is probably your hardest matchup out of, you know, like the top, you know, five or six decks in the formats. Um, and that matchup is, you know, pretty difficult, especially if they win the coin flip, they just have so many ways to beat you. I think your Zard matchup is relatively close. I think it's probably about 50 50. Um, I think the problem is, is that your deck takes a lot of 50 50s, you know, and I think that was that was definitely very stressful um, for my tournament was I felt like I could lose to pretty much any deck. Um, I think that a lot of variants, you know, kind of went my way. Um, and I think that um, I hit some, you know, pretty decent matchups throughout, but I think that. Um, the metagame, you know, heading into the next couple tournaments will get a little bit more hostile. Um, I don't necessarily know if I'll play. It definitely is, you know, one of my top considerations. But um, I do think that it's not, I guess, considered the best I can format heading into the next couple of events. But um, I would say that if it's something that you're comfortable with, you know, like definitely makes a solid choice. Um, you definitely need to play a lot of games with the deck. This is yeah. probably one of the hardest decks I've ever played. Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, grind out, you know, lots of games. I definitely think it's still good, though. But it takes some really, really close matchups against pretty much the majority of the field. So kind of have to accept that. But sure. then again, we've seen um, like some decks in the past, you know, for example, like Zorark, you know, like that was a deck um, like back in the day. That was a deck that took 50 50s versus, you know, pretty much the entire format. So we've seen these decks in the past, you know, still see lots of success. So. All right. So uh, the last thing I wanted to do then was just do quick meta predictions for Lille. Obviously, uh, one week after Louisville, probably too much. Well, things can change in, to some degree. We'll see. But uh, you mentioned already, Michael, that uh, you expect some more loss box, but not like a substantial amount probably, right? I mean, I think it will be a substantial increase over what the amount loss box would sure, have played sure. in. But by no means I do I expect to be like a substantial share of the meta. Maybe like a five percent max i would probably say i don't mm -hmm. really see it ever getting more than that gotcha so uh i think i think for me then i i on it, i would expect rage bolt numbers to either stay the same maybe even go up more <laughs> honestly they, they might be emboldened by uh caleb winning plus the bravery charm build kind of uh doing pretty well at louisville uh so it'll still probably be number one but it might be even in higher percentage because everyone who was like thinking about dropping it will probably just be like oh it's it's good i'm just gonna play it again anyway um, and then other than that, I think it'll mostly be the same, uh, in terms of like placements of stuff. And of course, lost box being more, what do you think, Gabe? What do you think? Um, I think bolt will definitely be the most played deck in the format. I think that more people have, you know, more reasons to play it. I think that's like the biggest thing, you know, pretty much like, like you said, I, I think that the deck will probably hit around 15 to 16%. Um, I think that, you know, Lost Box will definitely see some type of rise. I bet it probably gets to 3 to 4%. I don't expect it to go any higher than that. I think um, that would be, you know, pretty optimistic to think that a lot of people are going to, like, switch over. 
um, the very last second to last box. I think Paul K. Dustnor, I think actually Paul K. Dustnor got on the first, you know, part of the graphic. I think it was sitting around six or seven percent of yeah, the format. Seven point seven five. Uh, yeah, so I think that deck is still in like really good. I think the meta will look almost identical, except that we'll see probably a little bit more Terrapagos, maybe. Um, I think that like despite its results not being like overly exceptional, I think that it's like definitely a deck that I think people finally have um I think like access to. I mean I think that, like so many people like now like have the cards for it so i think that does you know kind of matter um but i think that bolt will definitely like far and away i think that actually the biggest drop off will probably be dragapult you know dragapult heading yeah. into this tournament didn't necessarily see a whole lot of success um it was kind of i would say i wasn't that surprised i think a lot of people i know that jake was saying that you know dragapult's just a stronger zard i think that was on the last podcast i said that i still liked zard <laughs> that was proven correct so um i i think that zard is still incredibly powerful um, i think that deck is probably going to remain probably in the top three to four um i think dragapult was definitely the loser of this weekend and i you know yeah, I the highest, highest placing one was top 32 24th yeah yeah, yeah. top 32 so yeah I'm glad to be proven right. I thought Zard was better from the beginning, but yeah. Especially after getting proven wrong better. about Raging Bolt. So yeah. It's true. It's true. <laughs> One for two. I'll take 50%. I, I do think that Pult was exposed as somewhat of a fraudulent deck. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Dude, I tried the deck and I was losing to Zard. I was like, I don't know what Jake's talking about, but this deck does not feel as good as you know, like people are saying it is. I don't know. Yeah, I was seeing like, I mean, I'm probably not great at the deck, but I was seeing like so much hype online so much like glazing about how good the deck was and i think it was a really good play to that event people didn't really know how to play against it but i think now that the, like the list is well known i just i don't think it's that great of a, a play to a tournament yeah i agree like it was crazy seeing the twitter glazers out in full force and that was not really a deck that i felt like was that was that strong um i feel like like if, i don't know okay i've like said this about stuff before but like i feel like the deck needs Pidgeot, and if Pidgeot Dragable isn't like a very good deck, then like I just don't think the deck is like good because I don't really know how the deck works without being able to find the cards you need every turn. I feel like playing against that, I have so much like control over what they're able to do. If you like don't take knockouts, they can't fez, they don't really have a great draw engine, a great way to find cards. If they go for like the attack and then they have like a crystal on and you just go vacuum hit into them, now all of a sudden they have to use like their one of Crispin. So if, like if you like, if you're playing a Spirit Team deck, like Lost Box, you put that down, they can't Luminion. Now they can't, like, ever Crispin. They can't, like, set up another Dragapult. Like, their deck just, like, has so many different issues. Um, It, like, doesn't have great ways to find cards. I don't know. It feels like without Pidgeot, you, they can't really ever, like, set up a secure board yeah. to, like, win the game. But, I don't know. So, uh, what are your predictions, then, Andrew, for this weekend's meta, besides, I guess, decrease in, in Dragapult? Yeah, so the the decrease in Dragapult, we saw like Dragapult convert very badly. It was on the graphic day one, and then it did not make the graphic day two, and like Charizard was kind of the deck that got on the graphic instead. So I would say definitely see a slight decrease in Dragapult from that, although I think it will probably still make the day one graphic. I don't think people are going to be like changing their decks too much in the last week before the event. Um, but uh, yeah, probably a little bit more Bolt. I don't think that that deck will change that much, though. I don't. I think... The Raging Bolt players are the Raging Bolt players, and I don't think there's that much more room to pick up more players. But I don't, yeah, I don't really expect too many big changes. Lost Box probably gets a little bit. Definitely not going to be on the first page of the graphics yeah. still. Um, so I would not be too surprised if we just see pretty similar to everything yeah. we've seen in the last couple of events. I, I will add, after uh, you kind of mentioned it, I kind of forgot about it, but I do think Charizard well, has, has like the most likely chance to pop onto day one graphic out of the decks that didn't make it this time because i think uh i don't know european european players love their charizard and i think it, it proved that it was pretty good this weekend uh, i don't think there's any reason for that to change for this weekend so uh, what was the play rate i don't know i think it was i think it was six percent around for zard that's crazy but that's i would cool. i would have to agree with that take i i I could not really see zard missing the top six again especially i think it'll just take a lot I think it lost some of those players that normally would play Zard to Dragapult, and I think a lot of them, maybe that would have switched for Leal, I think a lot of them will be back playing Zard, probably. Uh, did you have any other uh, thoughts, Michael, on uh, meta changes, or is that basically it? 
Yeah, I I can't really see anything else changing too much. Like I said, I think I agree. Bolt will go up. I think maybe Drago goes down, but that could be completely wrong. And then I think Zard gets back on the day one graphic and probably top four, like relatively high. I think it was, I think it was a fluke that it wasn't on it for this event. I I'm not really sure why it wasn't, but I it wasn't. So, but I I would be pretty surprised to not see it. I remember, I was trying to remember the, the previous episode, and Gabe, you were there, but everyone else wasn't super high on it, but I don't remember the reasons. Do you, do you remember <laughs> on uh, Charizard? Um. So Jake and them said that, it, okay, so Jake specifically said it was just like um, worse, like Dragapult and that. Right, In right, right. games that you could Pidgeot, you wouldn't have like enough turns to spend a turn using something like the um, you know, Pidgeot, like... I guess because the former was just like so sped up, but I actually think that Zard is able to respond to a lot of the turbo decks, you know, kind of running hot on you better um, than I think that Dragapult is. I also think that the majority of Raging Bolt lists, pretty much, I think all of the top placing ones aren't playing Briar anymore. And yeah. I think that matchup, if they don't play Briar, is like not even competitive. Like I've, I played that matchup quite a bit and like I never lose that matchup. Like I legitimately feel like if they don't play Briar, it's like 70 30. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like another thing, you know, kind of going for it. Um, I think that Zard just kind of does everything well. I don't think it does anything like exceptionally great. Uh, like I think it's just probably the most balanced deck overall in the format. And it's also very good at stealing games that I feel like it shouldn't win. Like there are just like so many games where like I'm down like several prize cards and my board is just absolutely nothing. And then I get like one Zard up, I hit them with like a reset stamp and then they just lose. Yeah, yeah. Or unfair stamp, not reset stamp. That card's been gone for years. <laughs> but yeah, um, we know what you mean. Yes, yes. Stamp thing. But yeah, you know, like I feel like your comeback potential is just like so good, and I feel like you steal so many games. So yeah, I feel like it's still going to be good. Like I think that like the deck is not going to die. I think it's going to do um, very very well this weekend. I think its Trapagos matchup is actually probably slightly favored. I think it's actually pretty okay. That definitely was a matchup that I was kind of trying to avoid. I think if you add in, you know, something like Manaphy as well, your Zard matchup becomes, um, or your Lost Box matchup for Zard becomes significantly better. I think that that's like really really big because I feel like Lost Box's main, you know, win con um, in like a lot of games is just you know, like trying to, you know, kind of run them over. I uh, I think that Michael got off the turn to like Radiant Greninja in games one and three, right? Or you were able to get it off really, really quickly on him, right? Because I was watching some of the game. It felt like you kind of ran him over early. For for my top four game? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, attack with Pidgeot, uh, right? I was like, what is happening? Yeah. So the only turn one Greninja, I, or the only turn one Mirage Gate I got off the whole tournament was in my game one against Sebastian, or Sebastian Lashman playing Zard. So. Yeah, I mean, it, without Manaphy, uh, Lost Fox is forced... Or, sorry, with Manaphy in play for Zard, Lost Fox is forced to go down a much heavier Sableye route, which is a lot less powerful. So, Manaphy definitely is very annoying for a Lost Fox. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I will say, uh, clearly, this tournament, and I guess also Lima, was, like, the best time to cut your Briars, uh, especially if Charizard was going down for Raging Bolt, specifically. Um, but... My, yeah, I remember like the whole thing with Briar was like, oh, you actually can like maybe have a chance against Charizard now. It's awesome, but no one's playing it. Maybe you bring it back. I know. Uh, actually, Xander did play it. So. I think oh, he did. Play yeah, Xander it. did oh. play the Briar. So not everyone did. He that. said it was bad though. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I think a lot of Zard players also say the card is bad. Like I think it's still like uh, favorite seen, like, for Zard anyway, posts. right? So it's like. Oh no, no no! Just like I'm saying, just like the card in general. I think that just like Briar. I think a lot of decks, except for Terrapagos, have been trying it out, and so like this card like barely comes up. Like I think at Dortmund, I used it once the entire tournament, mm -hmm. and then there's been like plenty of other players who have like played it in Bolt and say, "Oh, this card's terrible." And then I've seen like multiple other. Um, like, I think not playing it in Zard is crazy, but. <laughs> I don't know. That card never comes up. I think the threat of it is just kind of what makes it worth. There are like so many scenarios that I'm like, yeah, bro, bro I would just like winge in this scenario in Zard. I, I never used it, but then again, I only got top of 28, so. I mean, it sounds yeah, helpful against Lost bit. Box, so. Just oh. getting against Lost Box. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go into our bonus episode for the Patreon in just a moment here. Again, we're going to talk about general kind of deck building for regional uh, making sure you make the right choices, uh, getting those last like one or two cards finalized for your list. We'll talk to uh, everyone here for how they approach it. But other than that, I think that's going to be it for this emergency episode of the Dead Draw Gaming Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube. 
Uh, I will say th this was an emergency episode, but it ended up being just like a normal kind of full episode. So uh, we will be back in two weeks after this episode. We'll be back on like the normal two week cadence. And then if there's another emergency, we'll just kind of squeeze it in whenever is needed. Um, any shout outs from anybody? I know two people here have a masterclass coming up. So uh, whoever wants to talk about it. Yeah, me and Michael are going to be running a masterclass this Sunday on Lost Box. Uh, talk about the the deck, matchups, and like how it could change going forward. Um, we, we both put a lot of time into the deck, practicing it, building the list. So we know a lot about the deck and we would love to help you if you would like to learn more about the deck. So be sure to check that out. The link is uh, it can be found on both of our Twitters, which my Twitter is Alice Liverpool, A-L-L-E-Z Liverpool, and Andrews is Pokey Hawkeye, P-O-K-E Hawkeye. Yeah, I'll be sure to put a link to that in the description as well. If you're interested in checking that out, definitely support uh, two, two of the brightest in the game to, who have been playing Lost Box for forever. So uh, definitely check that out. Any other shout outs from Michael or Andrew? Um, he already got my Twitter. So yeah, just go follow me there. And that's about it. Cool. Uh, Gabe, shout outs for you. Uh, shout out to Dead Draw Gaming. Um, shout out my coaching as well. Um, like all my socials, all that stuff is all the same. Smart TCG. Um, you can find me pretty much anywhere on all the main social media platforms. Um, I will not be going to Lil. Um, I will be going um, to Poland. Um, so see me. Like make sure to uh, say hi. And yeah, looking forward to playing more Pokemon. When is uh when is that one? Uh, two and a half weeks. Two I believe weeks. Lil is this weekend. It's, uh, then... First weekend of November, I believe. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's, that's basically the next. The next NA regional is Sacramento, which is like late November, right? So. Yeah, they're a lot more spread out this year. From yeah, what yeah I after, after LAIC. Bro, yeah. We decided LAIC should be this format, and then we're going to have a regional <laughs> the week after that's a new format. <laughs> Yeah, that, that like I, I think that's gonna be the case for like EU IC too, right? Unless they move up rotation and stuff. I think they're well, doing it for the whole like having an event right after an IC that's in a different format because like you want to practice a lot for the ICs. Yeah, yeah. Those are like worth more, but then you have a new format right after. I'd prefer they just like make both events in one format, just like pick one, because like that's pretty annoying to have to like test two different formats at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we'll fly back and then we'll fly to Sacramento pretty much. That's like what like a lot of people are doing. I have a feeling some people are just going to go Sao Paulo to Sacramento. Like I wouldn't even be surprised if sure. Like, Maybe you plan. I mean, I don't. I don't <laughs> think a lot. Of I think some people will. Oh no, no, no! Because like some people leave like on Monday and then it takes them like like a full day to get back. So I think that some people might like potentially just like go to California. That's right a lot away. of. Uh, that's a lot of. Uh, paid time off you got to take. So I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Some people work remote, dude. A lot more people than you think work remote that play this game in Brown. Sure, but... that's true. That's true. I'm sure. I'm sure Michael's school would have no problem with doing something like that. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, as I didn't do my, I didn't do my ideas. Uh, for me, you can follow me on Twitter at etchy okay and on Twitch, twitch.tv slash etchy. Thank you so much for listening. We're gonna go record that bonus episode for the Patreon, which again you can check out in the description below. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.